year during the Distinguished Home Awards. No one's ahead. And we're very excited to have our new Distinguished Home Award winners. As you've seen all over the village, we have these signs up. It's like they're sprouting throughout town. And it just makes us aware that we have very special homes in our town. And we want the village and the people that live here to recognize this architecture. It's very uniquely linked to us and very important to us. And Paul Bergman does a fantastic job on researching these homes. And Paul, okay. take Good. it away. Here we go. All right, well, I am Paul Bergman. And we're going to spend uh, a bit of time talking about the houses today. Everybody's asked over the years that I add a little bit more information about the houses. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about architecture today. But first I want to talk a little bit about the program. Uh, this is our 13th year of doing this. Um, we've given out over 60 awards so far. Kathy talked about the town blooming in signs, and that's what we were hoping was going to occur. And, and, and I hope you all are pleased with all of the signs that we have in town. So we have, uh, in our judging process, uh, we generally follow the National Park Service guidelines, the National Historic Register guidelines for historic homes, but we also add a Lake Bluff spin to that. So we follow the guidelines that are under the national guidelines for preservation, restoration, renovation, adaptive reuse, infill, and then we add our own Lake Bluff his, uh, history twist to that, which is um, the Heritage Award. And we award that for houses that may not be architecturally fancy or architecturally special, but they have a, a, a social uh, impact or a social history of the town that we like. Our judging committee consisted this year of Kathy O'Hara, Lynn Grenier, Janie Jurch, Nan Caldwell, and myself. We are all board members. This year, Mike Farley, a longtime resident and docent here at the museum, uh, joined us. Mike brings a lot of energy to the process and brings a wonderful questioning sense of humor to this, so we're thankful for him. And Beth Kepper uh, is our former board member and actually the person who founded our award program. So as we get started, I want to say a few words uh, about, the, about the process and our panel. First off, we always have too many houses to work from. This year, our list had 45 houses on it that we reviewed. Uh, some folks ask, why not this house? Why not that house? Chances are we have already looked at the house. And if you only have six awards and 45 houses on the list, I'm sorry, but some houses just simply don't make it. Um, one of the things that's so exciting about doing this is that every year there are spirited discussions that we get into in doing this. All of our um, judging panel members uh, come from different backgrounds, different educations. Some people have a deep understanding of architecture. Others have a deep understanding of the social history of Lake Bluff. Everybody is interested in architecture. We all have, we have interesting discussions and sometimes we have spirited discussions. So that's kind of the fun of doing this process. But we always ask, what is it about Lake Bluff that we like so much? What drives our passion for this community? Uh, what are we looking for in the Distinguished Home Awards? We're looking for homes that demonstrate and preserve the general and somewhat indefinable ideal of Lake Bluff character. And the village of Lake Bluff has a marketing program uh, that tries to market character of Lake Bluff, but we keep trying to look for that indefinable thing that we find so important about Lake Bluff. We are always looking for heritage, character, streetscape, and that personable feel. And we're not going to maintain that if we tear down 5% of the houses in this village every year. Suddenly that personable feel is going to disappear. And we keep seeing that happening. So, some of the comments that we get when we go through this. Some of the questions we say, that, that, that I hear, people will say, our judges will say, the house is in scale to the neighborhood. The house is in scale to the lot. One of my favorite comments is, would the original owner still recognize their house today? That's one of the neatest questions to hear. Is it part of our history? Is it part of Old Lake Bluff? Now, our awards from the Distinguished Home Awards are from the Lake Bluff History Museum. They are purely honorary. So there's no limitations on your property. 
And also there are no tax benefits that come with the award also. It's just purely honorary and it's just part of the pure fun of living in Lake Bluff. So we're now going to move into the awards program. Our houses this year break down into two historical groups. There's a number of historical eras in Lake Bluff. There's the settlers era from the 1830s when the first settlers came here. And you can see a lot of those images here on the walls. Over here we have grandma clothes up against the wall. Um, well then we have the camp meeting era when the Methodists came here. And closely related to that is when the camp meeting era turned into the uh, country club or the sort of the B&B &B era where, this turned, where Lake Bluff turned into a, more of a resort community, a much more secular community. After 1905, the, the community turns into a railroad suburb and begins converting from being a camp community, a summer resort, to being full season, 20, uh, full, full season, uh, four season houses. The houses are much more substantial uh, and much better built and much larger. Our houses this year break down into two groups. One is from the camp meeting country club era, the 1875 to 1905 era, and then the second is 1905 to 1945. So the houses break down nicely into two different groups. But first we're gonna stop, first we're gonna start and talk a little bit about this gentleman here. This is Andrew Jackson Downing. He uh, is the grandfather and the father of American landscape design, American urban planning. He wrote a book called The Treatise on the Theory and Practice of Landscape Gardening in 1842. He literally wrote the book that lasted for about 40 or 50 years. He wrote the book on landscape design and urban planning. He then also wrote a book on design theories of cottage residences. And there we're gonna see some amazing similarities between those houses and the couple of the houses that we have here today. Downing also believed in the conceptual, the concepts of what he was talking about is the picturesque or dramatic environments, which we have in our ravines and beach, and beautiful environments, which is calm and serene, which we see in the lovely boulevards of Lake Bluff. And so he keeps seeing these two different theories that work back and forth, and we certainly have that with our beautiful boulevards in Lake Bluff, leafy trees, nice yards and whatnot, surrounded then by these very dramatic ravines and the beach. And if you've been down to the beach when the north wind is blowing, you know it can be a very dramatic place. Jack Downing is also a moralist, and he fits right in with Solomon Thatcher and Abner Scranton and all of the founders of the Methodist camp era. If the Methodists are interested in prohibition, they're interested in suffrage, they're interested in abolition, they're interested in all of the great social, er social concepts of the era, he is also a moralist. A good house will lead to a good civilization. There is moral influence in a country house. A good house will encourage its inhabitants to, preserve, to pursue a moral existence. It will better those around it. And doesn't that sound like the wonderful moralizing that, uh, that, that, that our, uh, our, our um, camp meeting followers had? And here we see a uh, picture, several pictures from his book on um, design for houses. One of the houses that he was very um, adamant in, in, in uh, advocating was this cross gable Gothic style house. And I want you to look at the beautiful cross gables that come on that, the little dormer windows with the little uh, peaked roofs uh, in the center there, and then another big sharp dormer there. You can see he's modeling it over there and doing it in stone. So this is what he is saying that he thinks is an appropriate house to be building in the countryside in the 1850s. And then, here we get to Ann and Jeffrey Walter's house at 601 Center Avenue. And does this house look like the Andrew, Down the Andrew Jackson Downing house I just showed you? It has the wonderful tall gables. It has the beautiful little dormers on there. 
One of the things that Downing advocated was porches on the front of the house. Porches on the front of the house immediately connect you to nature. And here we see the porch on the front of this house. Next slide. And if we come around, step uh, a quarter of the way around the house, now we see the, the, the cross gable and more of these beautiful dormers on the house. And if we step one more, we see on the side of the house, you can see this beautiful addition on the side of the house over the garage that's added to the house. And you can see this lovely gable that's been added, the beautiful little railing uh, up, up above the doorway, and this beautiful wraparound porch. So these are all of the things that we see that we like in the Walters house. We see that it has a direct relationship back to um, Andrew Jackson Downing, and we think it's a splendid part of Lake Bluff. And so are the Walters here? You want come up. Or, oh, here. If you'll come up here, I would like to give you the, our, the award. Good. And our friend Pam over here is going to take a oh, photograph oh, okay. here. Right. Okay. Good. And there we go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. All right. Now, staying with our friend Mr. Downing. One of the other styles that Downing was a big proponent of was the Italianate style of house. And in looking at the Italianate style of house, he's looking at a house that has this long shed roof on it, his favorite, the big front porch that goes on it, and then this little dormer thing that goes over the front of the house, and then the chimneys in the center of the house. And this comes right out of Downing's catalog book. And here we see the house at 421 Center, the Krivoshek's house. This house is built in 1905. There's some evidence that it was built, may have been started in 1893, but probably built in, 18, in 1905, which is great. But you can see the long shed roof concept here. You can see the front porch on it. And you can see this gable face over the top of it. So it's following through right in the middle of Downing's theories on, on architecture. And so now if we take a side view of the house, you can see these wonderful rounded bay windows. Here's a big two-story bay here, and then a smaller second-story bay over here with these nice rounded shapes to them. This is all part of this Downing concept of beautiful and serene uh, gardening and, and beautiful serene landscape. And you can see that the Krivoshek's have fallen right into that with a beautiful um, uh, hammock out in the front yard. And so beautiful, serene, and, and let's take a nap. So this is a house that stays right in the moment. And one of the things that probably most people see about this house are the beautiful stone columns that hold, hold up the porch on this house. If you think back to 1905, when there were half the houses on this street and twice the trees, this stonework would add a beautiful sense of rusticity to the neighborhood. The whole environment would suddenly seem to be a lot more out in the countryside, which is part of what Downing is talking about. So the Krivoshek's have also done a tremendous amount of work on the house. They have done a great deal of work in remodeling the interior of the house. They have replaced and rebuilt stained glass windows that are in the house and done all sorts of other interesting work to the house. But in addition to that, we need to talk about the social history of the house. This house was built by a na man named Fred Cornish. In the 1890s, Cornish was a real estate developer and secretary of the Camp Meeting Association. In 1898, he published a map of lots for sale in Lake Bluff. We have that map framed upstairs. Um, he was president of the village, and he ran in a contested election in 1902. In 1902, he then guided the village through permitting the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad to build the crossover that comes from their freight tracks over here to the commuter tracks. At exactly the same time, the electric line was pushing south from Waukegan down to Lake Forest and on its way down to Chicago. The electric line paid an enormous franchise fees for the electric work that they did, 
which gave the village enough money to build the village hall. He donated the two lots that the village hall sits on. At the same time, he masterminds building this huge underpass that we have, that we have right in the center of town. So this is a guy who is Mr. Lake Bluff from the very beginning. <coughs> if you go to the village hall, just before you walk in the front door, there's the cornerstone, and his name is etched in the cornerstone right on the front of it. So there's a tremendous social history that we want to celebrate with this house also. And so if the Krivisheks could come up, we will give you your award. <coughs> All right. Good. Here we are. Good. And our friend Pam is going to take a picture. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good. Moving on to our third house, this is Steve and Joan Krause. And this is our third adaptive reuse house in Lake Bluff. We don't think of Lake Bluff as being full of horse stables, but we have a number of them. This is the third one that we've given an award to. Um, Steve and Joanne represents a conversion from one era, from the horse era to, a, to the newer modern era. And it also represents um, for the Krauses, adding sweat equity to your house, which is part of the Lake Bluff tradition. But we are quite interested in this property as it was a stable to the two Swift cottages on Prospect Avenue. So we're standing here on Park Place. If you go directly through the yard on the Prospect, there are two cottages there that are the, called the Swift cottages. Gustavus Swift built the first cottage in the 1880s. Shortly after that, he built a second cottage for his son. They then went on to build the Swift Meatpacking Company, which is one of the largest meat packers in Chicago. In the 1880s, they ran a livery service in Lake Bluff for the benefit of all of the camp residents who were coming. And what really interests us about this building is this arch right here. This and this set of windows right here. If you will imagine that opening without the stairs in front of it and with stable doors on it, <coughs> that was the stable entrance for a long shed stable that was long enough to hold both the horses and the livery wagon that was pulled. And so you could pull the wagon and the horse inside to get them out of the weather. Then we believe that the horse could be stored on the back side of the building the stable stored on the front side of the building and up above would have been where the teamster lived. So, so here's the arch, a much closer look and the side windows. This is what this house looked like before the Krauses began remodeling this. This is a 1973 realtor's photograph and you can really see the shed here. You can see how this building had this long shed, this beautiful dormer up on the front and then this beautiful shed behind it. We think the the horses would enter this side. At the far end of the shed was another matching arch which, with doors on it. And so the horse could come in this way and come out the other way and go around town. <coughs> if you've ever walked around Lake Bluff on a July afternoon, if you had somebody come by in a horse carriage and say, would you like a ride? You'd say, yes, I'd very much like that. So that would be a very neat service that the Swift family would be providing. So the second part of this is the sweat equity that the Krauses have put into the house. This is a long time tradition in Lake Bluff of people fixing up and, and remodeling their houses. Now Steve told me that when he was remodeling the house that he found horse chew marks inside on the stud work in this shed area where the horses would be parked and or stabled and the, the horse would be chewing on the woodwork. He said he then learned how to drywall and do all of the carpentry work. When they first moved into the house, they immediately had to remodel the second floor uh, master bedroom because the ceiling was falling down. So within the first couple of weeks of having moved into the house, uh, they had to um, uh, keep that from collapsing on them. And then every time they had another girl, they had to remodel the house. <laughs> and so Steve said that, uh, he would hire contractors to help him do the work that he couldn't do himself, but that he turned into a pretty good carpenter and a pretty good drywaller. 
and that his wife also then turned into a pretty good painter and a pretty good wallpaperer also. So they remodeled the house in 1975, 1979, and 1988. In 1988, Steve had the foundation, the part under this part of the house, dug out of the house. And he said he literally stacked the house up on posts and had the, the earth moving machine digging underneath the house to pull the dirt out. And that Steve was down there with his shovel uh, helping with the excavation. And, uh, that is nothing but sweat equity. So uh, we honor this for both being a stable and also for being an adaptive reuse and for being a part of Lake Bluff. So Steve, we would... Thank you. There we go. Good. All right. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so now we shift gears a little bit. We're going to move into the railroad suburb conversion era. And the last three houses we have to talk about is when Lake Bluff went from being a summer resort community to being a year-round suburb. Roughly 1905 this happens when all of the railroad work gets done, and then finally in the 1920s it really begins to take off. But the houses become much more substantial in size. The houses are fully insulated. The houses have electricity, they have plumbing, there's no more outhouse out in the backyard, and so we now become much more, uh, much more of the community we recognize today. So the first house we have, this is Wendy and Brad, Wendy Clark and Brad Saddlewater. Uh, this is at 608 Ravine Avenue, and they have what's called an American Four Square House. And this one I got from the uh, Sears and Roebuck catalog. This is a very simple house form that came to replace many of Downing's houses. This is sort of the generation of architecture that comes after Downing's fanciful cottages. The four square is designed to be a big square house. It's designed to maximize the absorption of the lot. And so it wants to be big and square. It's defined by having a, front, a large front porch, which is Downing, but it's also part of the American four square. It has a, hip, a double hip roof, so there's, the roof is in four planes, and the roof has uh, these little dormers across the top of that, and then with a center chimney. So that's what describes the American four square house. And here we have Wendy and Brad's four square built in 1924. And as you can see, the, the porch has been remodeled into a four season room, which is not uncommon for these houses. Uh, it has uh, the small eyebrow dormer up in the roof plane. And we think the eyebrow dormer is especially cute because it's a little stylistically, a little fancier than, than some of the just square uh, uh, dormers that you find up there. And uh, it provides uh, space up into the attic space. And so here you see on the side of the house, the new front door is located on the side of the house into the driveway. If you remember from the Sears slide I showed you just a couple slides ago, that had a door on the side of it also. I selected that slide because this house may have always had a door on the side of the house. When they filled in the front door to make this into a four season room, then this existing side door then became the front door to the house. And so then further down the driveway is the garage and a 1991 addition to the house. And then this last view, this is another side view of the house. And I want you to look at this beautiful row of ribbon windows that are along the side here. Uh, this is a very popular style of window use in the 1920s. Frank Lloyd Wright used this extensively, as did other prairie style architects. And you can see there's another one of those eyebrow dormers up in the roof line. So that's what we have to say about that for the Wendy and Brad's house. Are they here today? Yeah, and we'll go to the next one. So then we get to Clint and Carolyn Mitchell's house at 526 Scranton Avenue. And this house is a Georgian revival house in form, which was wildly popular in the 1920s through the 1950s. And I wanted to show you a couple of examples of this before we showed you their house. This house comes in two forms. It can either be five windows over four with a door, or it can be three windows over two with a door. And so it comes sort of in a large size and a small size. It can either be clabbered or brick. 
It can have a double hip roof on it, or it can have a shed roof on it. But what you almost always find with all of the American or the Georgian colonial houses are the double hung windows with the large window mullions and a huge, beautiful door case on the house. And so here we have Clint and Carolyn's house. When we first started looking at this house, I thought it was one of the uh, Red Harlan houses. And Red Harlan was a developer in town and built many beautiful houses. He has a number of examples like this. But it turns out this isn't a Harlan house, but nonetheless, it's still a, just a honey of a house. Um, this house was built in 1925. Lake Bluff is maturing rapidly in the 1920s. The first house we saw is 1924. This is 1926. And the next house is 1927. So the houses are coming rather rapidly. So we've talked about the mullions in the windows. Now I want to show you the door case on this house, because that is really one of the most splendid parts of this. So in Georgian architecture, there's a number of things I want you to take a look at. Starting from the outside, you have this beautiful pilaster, which supports the entablature, which is this whole opening. Then it is mounted by, then it's flanked by these wonderful side light windows, which help illuminate the hallway. Then in the center, you have a six panel door. You can find this six panel door all over England. Everywhere you go in Georgian England, you will find this six panel door. It is that popular. Over the top of the door and the side lights is this beautiful transom light done in radiant mullions. So the mullions stand up this way and then have little scallops underneath them. Between the radiant transom and the side lights, that all illuminates the hallway inside. And then over the top of that is this monumental entablature. And look at the moldings. There's a molding here, a molding here, and a molding here. This is all designed to add to the monumentality of the house. And this is what makes this a really nice Georgian house. Then there's a couple of other little side things we want to talk about. Downing put the porch on the front of the house. The Georgians tended to put the porch on the side of the house. This makes for a porch that's a lot more private. So it's a lot, it's a lot quieter. You're kind of off the street. Typically, these porches get turned into four-season porches. We're so pleased that this isn't a four-season porch, at least yet. The other thing we like about it is this beautiful railing. For the Georgian houses that are built on the ocean front, a lot of the houses have what's called a captain's walk. Sometimes they're called widow's walks. This little railing is evocative of that, of that railing. And the third thing I want to show you is really small, and it's just a really, really fun little detail. On the downspout, there's this gutter box. And the gutter box has an architectural reason, and it also has an engineering reason. The architectural reason is to make the house look finished and make the house look beautiful. This downspout has flowers on it, and I believe that they are Tudor roses that are embossed in the flower box. And that adds this little finishing detail to the house. The second thing is the engineering purpose for that. As the water comes uh, on a heavy rainstorm, as the water comes rolling off of the roof and down that downspout, down a big S curve, the water is bubbling and gurgling along, gurgling along. And it stops for just a second at that drain box and it starts to swirl. And it only takes a half a second for it to stop and it starts to swirl. And that builds the velocity that it takes and rams all of the acorns and all of the leaves and stuff out of the downspout. It's a self-cleaning downspout. And that's the engineering part of it. Most gutter repair people don't know that. But we notice that in Lake Bluff, and we love it. It's one of the really neat details we like of the house. And so would you step forward? We'd like to give you your plaque. That's okay. That's fine. Good. Thank Here we go. You. All right. And okay. Got it? Okay. Good. So thank you. Thank you. So now we come to our last house. This is uh, Tom and Claire Concannon's house. And it isn't often that you can say that you live in an award-winning house. 
Most people can't really say that. The Concanons can. This drawing, this rendering that you see, is the award-winning rendering that was published in the Chicago Tribune. In 1927, the Chicago Tribune ran a contest for building or designing a house that will fit on a narrow, deep lot and be stylistically important and architecturally uh, within the moment, within the time period. And so this drawing was submitted by an Italian architect named uh, Amadeo Leone, who was practicing in Detroit. And he submitted this and he won the 1927 Tribune competition. It was featured in the Tribune Book of Homes and it was also published in Better Homes and Gardens. So let's take a look at the house. And so here we have the house. This is on Scranton Avenue. And it's this wonderful Mediterranean style house. Sometimes it's called Spanish colonial, other times Mediterranean colonial, uh, Mediterranean style. But there's a number of things about this house uh, that we like. Surprisingly, in 1927, this was a very popular style. By 1930, the style of this house had really fallen away. And so by 1930, there was very little interest left in this house. One of the things we, there's a couple of things we really like about this house. We love these beautiful brick coins that we see here, these little outcroppings of bricks and that's coins with a Q. And we love these very tall, narrow windows that we see in the center of the house. It has this beautiful Juliet balcony with these lovely stone corbels that it's perched on. And then it has these lovely dovecote openings up there. And that's all part of the charm of this. And while we're looking at it, look down the driveway, because the people who built this house had took enough money and enough effort, they didn't scrimp on this house, they built a masonry garage at the same time. So uh, this is a house that's full of details, it's a nice sumptuous house, it's wonderfully sited on its lot. Then here we get this wonderful, beautiful cut stone door case. And this is just a magnificent Spanish Mediterranean style door case for the house. And so if uh, Tom or Claire is here, I think we have we have a couple, of, a couple of little ones that are going to come help with this. Okay. Good. All right. So, step in here, Dad. Okay. So everybody's here. All right. Everybody going to okay. You grab a hold of that and take a smile. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you. So thank you very much. So that concludes our program for the most part. I would like to ask all of the owners, please put your plaque on your house. Please put it by your, we ask people to put it by your front door. So I want to thank all of our award winners this year. I want to thank everybody else for coming. I hope you all enjoyed the program and thanks for being part of Lake Bluff. This is a great special place we're in. So thank you very much. Thank you.